Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 556th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today we have Tom Burton. He is the founder of a uh, large CRM, handling large uh, deals, uh, but he's also the author of a new book, The Revenue Zone, the ultimate playbook for the next generation of B2B sales, marketing, and predictable revenue growth. It's good timing to have this. I'm working on a new program, so stay tuned for that, and it's called Predictably Profitable Pipeline. It's going to be where I uh, help you in an intense manner in a short period of time to rectify things and then support you ongoing for an entire year uh, to make sure that the new habits we create you stick with. Uh, you know, speaking of habits, um, a couple of episodes back, I did the um, Atomic Habits book review, so go and check that. Um, it'll be a good reminder for you. That was episode 553. And you know, the concept behind that, uh, which I've addressed many times over these nine years, you know, is that small hinges swing big doors. We tend to overestimate what we can do in a year and underestimate what we can do in three to five years. And so when we have these big, hairy, audacious goals, and then we don't even get close to achieving them, we beat ourselves up and then we stop. And it becomes you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy of, of loss, of failure. But, um, you know, an example I give all the time is that when I'm needing to watch my weight, what I'm, what I'm eating, I'm training for a jujitsu tournament or something. I, and, and it helps working from home, but more and more of us are now working from home. So, but still, even if you don't, you can pre-plan. Uh, but as soon as I eat a meal, I go brush my teeth, especially, uh, dinner. Cause that's when I tend to eat snacks and, and desserts. I, my wife and my five girls all bake. So, there's chocolate bundt cake, there's cookies, oatmeal raisin cookies, sugar cookies. Uh, oh my gosh, cakes. My wife doesn't, she doesn't do too many pies, but she does make this chocolate pudding Cool Whip pie. Oh man, man. There's always ice cream. So um, I just go brush my teeth right after dinner. And uh, that one little habit you know, takes a few minutes, right? Walk upstairs, brush your teeth, floss, brush your teeth, done. Uh, it, it helps alleviate the sweet tooth. Uh, but it just reminds me, you know, don't, don't ruin it. Don't go back and have to brush your teeth because you took a bite of something. So if you fix a bunch of little things, they have a compounding result, a compounding positive impact on you. Um, you know, since 2008, I've been an Infusionsoft, you know, now Keep partner. And people always wonder, you know, what can I get done? They'd always ask, well, how quick can I be up and running? And and I know what they mean, but I play with them. I say, well, about 25 minutes. They go, what? So, well, it depends on how you define up and running, right? I can build you a web form or a quick landing page, um, tied to an offer or sign up for my newsletter or contact us um, that's tied to an email that says, hey, thank you, we'll be in touch, delivers the report if they have one made. Um, then it assigns a task to a salesperson to follow up, maybe even creates an opportunity, you know, in an initial stage. I mean, I can do that 20, 25 minutes, no sweat. But what they mean is, like, how long before they can master it? How long can they, will it take to port over their info or create entirely new systems and processes to truly start to automate their lives? And, and that's a tough question to ask or to answer. But that ultimately, they're trying to get at the, to the root of it, which is, when will I realize a, a positive ROI on this investment? And so what I help them do 99% of the time, because they, they don't have this, is create a little follow-up sequence for people on their, on their team that are making outbound calls and getting someone's voicemail. Okay. I always tell them multimedia multi-step is the key 
to winning in sales today. And it really has always been the key, but now with so many ways to connect, it's it's super important that you you master more than one way to communicate and connect. So this multimedia multi-step is a phone call. You get their voicemail. Um, I help them create a script with multiple messages, not just, oh, hey, Wes or Tom, it's Wes again. Uh, man, you're a hard guy to reach. Uh, I'll try you back later. That's what most of you sound like. That's why you're not getting calls back. So we create a series of messages that, that tell a story over time. The, we send a corresponding email that reinforces that voicemail. And so phone call, leave the message, hang up, mark step one as complete. Boom. Completes the task, sends an email to the prospect. Boom. Assigns a task to make outreach number two for the salesperson. All with a couple of clicks. So when I show them that, if they have two or three or five salespeople making outbound calls, they're probably leaving 20 messages like that a day. So let's say each of those messages, you know, takes three minutes. Well, that's an hour a day of leaving a voicemail, then hopping back in the CRM, making some notes, closing the task, moving the task. Uh, typing up an email, sending it, looking for the template and sending it, you know, three minutes. So as soon as they're leaving that voicemail, they can be clicking the task done. So as they're leaving the voicemail, boom, the email is being sent out. So now instead of three minutes, it, it's done immediately. So now let's say, you know, you got three people on your team making these kind of calls. So now I've just freed up one hour a day per person, three people, it's three hours a day. Over the course of a week, it's 15 hours. Okay. And yeah, that, that creating that first one, it might take a few hours. I mean, I've done this enough times. The hardest part is convincing my new customers to let me help them tell their story. Uh, pulling that out of them. That's the hard part. Uh, but at least making that, that first email that ties into that first voicemail. So now I've given them 15 hours a week. Now they can't complain. And let's say, you know, it's just one person. I'm helping that one owner, solopreneur, whatever. I'm giving them back now one hour a day from one small task that they were already doing. Remember, small hinges swing big doors. But he's going to get that hour back for the rest of his life, an hour a day. Now I find another small, tedious task. I promise you, you're wasting two hours a day, minimum, no problem. So if I can alleviate that in the first week, right? Let's say we find two of them, two hours a day. I just give you back. So now you have 10 hours a week to spend on the software, enhancing your systems, building systems, looking at your bottlenecks. Life gets real good after that because now you have the time. So that's really what they're asking. And that's what I've helped people do since really 2007. I was working with another platform that was made by a local company. Uh, and I was doing this on my own going way back. Back in, I don't know, 2001, 2002 time frame, before we had Blackberries uh, as a standard. I got to know my IT company. I bought a Blackberry on my own. I had them BCC my my cell phone provider email so I could read them on my BlackBerry. You know, it wasn't IMAP, it wasn't synced, but at least I could respond to inquiries and things like that while I was on the road. Nobody else could. So by learning how to use technology to accelerate my sales is why you're listening to me today. Okay, that's what I've helped thousands of people do and 28, 29, probably 30 countries now. I can help you as well. So hit me up if you're interested. Uh, be on the lookout for the Predictably Profitable Pipeline program I'm rolling out right now. And uh, there's still the Make Every Sale on-demand content uh, you can get. There's the ongoing group, but I'm going to be 
I'm going to begin merging some of these groups, okay? Um, narrow my focus so I can give more of myself uh, to those people that are, that are investing in themselves, um, that are committed to growth. And um, when I'm around those people, it's just a glorious thing for all of us. So stay tuned. Now, let's bring on Tom. Tom Burton, author of The Revenue Zone, the ultimate playbook for the next generation of B2B sales marketing and predictable revenue growth. Welcome to the Sales Podcast, man. How the heck are you? Great. Thank you. Excited to be here. So do we really need a new book? Is this really ultimate? And is it really for the next generation? I mean, come on, man. Hadn't it all been said and we just need to go do it? Yeah, but we're 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 ready. We're overdue for a new one for a new playbook. We're and we're certainly overdue for an ultimate one, you know, given ever all the changes that have been happening over the last uh, couple of years. So Yeah, no kidding, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Good grief. Um so so what what led you to write this? Because I mean, there are a lot of sales books out there. Yep. Um and you know, I've had guys on good guys, you know, they're like the last book you'll ever need, but then they come out with another book. I'm like, Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> what just happened? Um, so what, what, what led to this? Yeah. A couple of things actually. So I, I have a software company, um, called lead smart technologies. I'm a co-founder in, and the software we sell is CRM and, and marketing automation type software. So we work with a lot of B2B clients. And, you know, I hear and work with them a lot and understand what they're up against, what they're struggling with as it relates to sales and in this world and, and so forth. That was so that was one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is and this is what I kind of talk about in the book is I was at a board meeting and, you know, I've been in sales and marketing my whole career, and which is well over 30 years now. So it's been a while. I've, I've seen a little bit of everything. And. You know, I was at a board meeting and presenting my pipeline and projections and and so forth for the next quarter. And one of the board members basically said, you know, how confident are you in this? And I was like, as I thought about it, you know, I didn't quite say it, but as I thought about it is I wasn't anywhere near as confident as I wanted to be. And I looked at, you know, how I was doing just my my forecasting, my planning, all of that. And I realized I was guessing more than I was actually predicting. And it was kind of those two things together. It was sort of that defining moment at that board meeting combined with, you know, everything we were seeing with our customers and our prospects in our software company. And this was, a I don't know, almost two years ago. And so it was like, okay, I need something new for us. I need something for our customers. And, and as I talked to more and more people, I found that they were, were looking for a little bit of a different approach as well. So a number of sort of events coming together that drove this. Yeah. It's, um, you, you basically wrote the book you wish you had been given 10 or 20 years ago. <laughs> or, or at least two years ago before I got in that board meeting. Yeah. <laughs> well, I remember, golly, it was, it was an early job. It was my first, well, it wasn't my first, my second high tech job. Uh, and Oh my gosh, the weekly sales beatings, you know, just everybody throwing out their numbers and our VP, you know, crunching them up and rolling them up. And, and I realized what a magician slash manager he was, right? It's like, oh, well, there's Tom. Tom's always overly optimistic. He says he's 95% sure. And we know it's about 70%. Well, there's Wes. He's a damn sandbagger. He says he's at 60, but he's probably at 92. So, uh, you know, so he's, he's downgrading, upgrading, massaging, putting in his own fudge factor. And I was, and I was like, man, this is a freaking mess. <laughs> the forecast of the forecast, right? <laughs> yeah. And just really having to massage those numbers, but that's, that's life in the big city for most companies, isn't it? Yeah. And what was, you know, as I peeled the onion, right, what I found was, you know, and, and it's, it's not like, you know, I, that was my first time that I had to do sales projections, Sure. but it was the first time that I really felt very unsure about what I was projecting. And, you know, as again, as I peeled the onion, what I recognized was a lot of our prospects were 
not as engaged as with us from a sales perspective as we would have liked. Yet they were still moving through their own due diligence, their own research, their all of that, you know, and they were doing it on their own and they really didn't want a lot of our involvement from our sales team. And that's when I, you know, not that this is new, but it really hit me over the head is that now more than ever, the B2B buyer wants to be in control of their own journey. They want to be in control of their due diligence. They want to talk to salespeople when they're ready to talk to salespeople and not before. So rather than fight that, right, and try and, you know, whether we like it or not, that's where the whole premise of the book came from is how do you work in this new world of the B2B buyer and how do you really turn that to your advantage by making those prospects really basically become part of your sales team and enable them to get where you need them to go. So that was the switch. Yeah. Um, would you say, I mean, prospects always want to feel like they're in control, right? But how, you know, I, I've always been saying that, you know, 95% of the sale happens when the prospect or when, when the salesperson leaves the room, right? Especially in a complex sale, this thing's taking months and multiple meetings and you got two to 22 decision makers, you're putting some input in there, you know, salesperson, you know, at best you're there an hour a week, right? Okay. It's a big deal. You could do a demo. All right. Maybe you're there. You got a systems engineer that's on site for maybe a week, maybe two weeks, but it's a systems engineer, not the salesperson. And they're working with the technician, not, not the true decision makers. Although, you know, the hands-on guy may, may, they may do what he recommends, but, but still salesperson isn't there the whole time. So haven't they kind of been in charge? Uh, maybe we just didn't want to admit it. Yeah. Well, I think to a degree for sure. Absolutely. But now you factor in, you know, hey, you're not doing on-site meetings. You're not seeing your prospects as often at events or, or shows. You're not necessarily meeting them. So a lot of things are going on virtually. So it's, it's been, you know, a bit amplified, if you want to call it that. Um, and so, what again, what I found and when found in talking to my customers and, and prospects is the problem, or, or if you call it a problem, the situation was even more more amplified, more severe than it's been in the past. So, so what changes? You got revenue zones here. Um, you are, you're walking us through step by step, right? Are these, are these basically stages like in a pipeline or is it, do you have a different approach on this? Yeah. So, so the idea is right. As salespeople, we want to get our prospect into what we what I call the revenue zone, which is at least to a place where they're seriously considering doing business with your company, right? Obviously, they're at that point they're maybe a contract or whatever, but you want to get them to a point where they're seriously considering spending money with you. And so, the idea, the big idea in the book is, is there's really two things that have to occur for that to happen, right? And that this isn't new, but the customer or the prospect has to have a good reasonable level of demand for your product or service, and they have to have a reasonable level, level of trust for your business. So how do you get them there? How do you get them from they don't know anything about you or anything about your product or anything about your company? How do you get them from there to that revenue zone where they have some demand or a decent level of demand for what you're doing and a decent level of trust for your business. And what I lay out is how you build what I call the yellow brick road that gets you from that point of, hey, I don't really know who you are to I'm, you're in, we have them in the revenue zone and we're doing that, facilitating the, the buyer doing most of the work themselves, right? We're letting, we're enabling, we're guiding the buyer or the, the prospect and the buyer down that road in the right sequence with the right information and shepherding them along into that revenue zone. And, and that shepherd process is what I call the yellow brick road. And a good chunk of the book goes into how you create that yellow brick road, how you put it together, how you organize it, and, and more importantly, how you monitor it and track it and then, you know, use analytics and data to continue to optimize it. Do you get into how do you get your foot in the door in the beginning 
or are you picking up once a, a conversation has begun? Yeah, good question. So I don't, in this book, we don't talk a lot about the prospecting effort as far as getting somebody to the place where they're aware of your product or you're aware of your company. Um, I could do a whole nother book on that, on that itself. So this is really once somebody has, you know, um, had some awareness, had some exposure. Okay. How do we take and leverage that exposure and keep them moving along? And so in this post COVID world, there are more people working from home. Um, I mean, heck, it's hard to even mail people something these days, right? I mean, it's, they're not going to give you their home address. It's not on the website. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's easier for prospects to hide. Yes. Um, it's maybe in some ways it's easier to get a meeting, but I'd say, say it's easier to get a meeting. It's maybe harder to have a meaningful meeting. Uh, so, well, and, and related to that, and this we hear all the time from our customers is, you know, they finally get an in-person meeting back at a, at a company site, but half the people are working from home or working remotely and they're on Zoom anyway. So they've kind of lost the whole idea of being able to have some of that personal interaction by being, you know, on site, so to speak. So, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, but I guess even if there's one person in person there, you can you can deepen the relationship a little sure. better. Sure. Uh, I mean, it's just better than nothing, but yeah, it's not, it's not the same. Nope. Um, so, so what can somebody do in this remote digital world? I mean, can you still get commitment? Do, do deals still close as quickly? Can they, can you still close large deals this way or, or is everything changing? No, I think, you know, I, I mean, obviously nothing's going to ever be completely black and white, but more and more, right. And, and this is the, this is the basic premise of the book of, of what's laid out in the book. If you take a mindset that, you know, okay, I'm going to, and, and I even recommend, Hey, just test this with maybe a specific product or a specific service. Don't, don't hand grenade everything you're doing in your whole company, but Basically, take a product or a service and look at it from the viewpoint of that the prospect is basically going to be, if you want to call it self-serve, the process. They're going to go through the process from knowing very little about you to getting to the point where you're in the revenue zone. What road would you want them to go down with that for that to occur so that you achieve that result with the highest probability? So outline that. Like look and say, okay, well, the first step would be is they watch a demo. The second step may be that they watch a customer case study or they read this, a blog post, or they go to a review site, whatever the case may be. What we found is there's generally about on average, and obviously different companies are, or different products are different, but about 25 touch points or 25 uh, points along the way that a prospect goes through to go from Hey, I don't really know much about you to the point where I'm willing to consider doing business with you. So what are those 25 ideal points that you would like to have them go through, which in and of itself is kind of revolutionary to a lot of companies. They've never really thought through that, that process. And then how do you set up your content, your website, your, you know, material, all of that kind of stuff in a way that you can lead that prospect digitally down that road as much as possible and monitor what's happening so you can see if they're making the progress that you're looking for. Yeah. Um, Are you, are you finding like our prospects, are are they more open now because maybe they feel safer because they're remote uh, or are they playing things closer to the vest because they, you can't connect as easily because they're remote. Meaning, do they want to stay incognito longer or, you know? Well, not necessarily incognito, but like if, if we meet in person, I can kind of pick up some some cues, look around the office, read some body language, adjust my style a little bit. Uh, maybe, you know, when people meet, sometimes they just like each other. Sometimes they just don't like each other. So, sure. so things kind of accelerate. But in general, still, the prospect's going to be like, well, I'm not going to really tell you my budget or we haven't really... 
uh, quantified the budget yet. So we're really just, you know, early stages, you know, like whatever, dude, like they need this next week, you know, but they're being a little coy. So sure. are, are they, do they play a little more hard to get in the current world or are they, uh, we're all in this together, right? Two years ago, we were all in this together and, you know, but like really we weren't, but you see yeah, what I'm I saying? Say, I would say it's a bit more hard to get and a bit less transparent right which is what you're talking about so the transparency is 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 less so and as a result you have to kind of judge by what you're observing and what they're doing versus what they're saying so um and again this is another advantage of this of the revenue zone concept is having the data so you can actually observe what the prospect is doing versus what they're necessarily saying and even certain content you know we found that obviously there's certain content and certain things that prospects will look at at certain stages of the of their own buyer journey right that not everything is all important at the same time mm -hmm. so if we're seeing evidence if that they're moving and looking at you know content that may be farther down that buyer journey then that gives us a bit more insights into where they're at and, and where things are really happening Mm hmm. Yeah, because you talk about the, the tech stack here in chapter seven. Um, so are you em employing, deploying uh, a little bit of uh, technology tracking clicks, uh, time on page, things like that? Like, hey, maybe I could do a little lead scoring here and bubble this guy up because he's definitely showing some buying signals. Yeah, absolutely. To a degree. Um, and one of the things we've tried to do in the tech stack is, you know, if you, most of the, I think of the, the products and the technologies that we discuss in the tech stack, most companies have these already, mm -hmm. you know, even how you use Google analytics, how you use some of the things you have already to have a bit more insights into what's happening and then be able to track that. And as you just said, you know, have more um, insights into what's actually happening as they, as they move along. Are prospects ever weirded out by that? Hey, I was just on your website. Or do people kind of know that's how things are today and, and maybe they even appreciate it? Yeah, I, I mean, I think people know, you know, obviously what's going on. At the same time, you know, the, our, we don't want to look like we're lurking, you know. So if you see somebody on the website or whatever and you immediately send them an email, say, hey, I saw you on my pricing page or something along those lines, yeah. which you do get, by the way. True. And that's not, and that and that does seem kind of, weird but the idea is here is not to stalk the prospect as much as it is to understand and enable them so if we know they're at a certain point in their journey then we can intelligently provide them the right information and the and the right content that they need and this is another thing there's some really good gartner studies on this that prospects when they you know try and do all their own research and you know spend all their time down rabbit holes on google and all of that they get really confused and really overwhelmed and it's not good for them either. Right. So, you know, if we can help them avoid that and help them, you know, move down a more logical path and avoid the, the rabbit holes and, and things like that, then you're going to have a much more less frustrated prospect as well that actually will make decisions. And that's what the Gartner study found is that, you know, when prospects get overwhelmed, they just don't make decisions. Right. It just it stops the sales cycle. Yeah, I always say a, a confused mind says no. Yeah. Yeah. Confused uh, prospects don't become customers. Yep. Yeah. Um, so you talk about like the delivering the right info at the right time and things like that. Or I've always wondered, you know, you see see companies do webinars or or executive briefings or creating their PDFs, their white papers, but you know, is, is the CEO of a billion dollar company, a $50 million company, is that CEO hanging out, hoping to read another white paper to learn, yep. you know, which widget to buy, which service company to retain, uh, like who, who's consuming this data? Well, it obviously will vary from product to product and, and what you sell, right? But yeah, in B2B, there's almost always a buying team unless you're selling to a really small, like owner-operated company. And then there may be the, 
the CEO is doing this type of thing. But there's generally, you know, again, there's generally somebody who is or a team that's uh, facilitating the process. There's different team members that are going through the, the process and, you know, gathering data and then potentially presenting it or, or getting approvals as they go along. So it'll vary by and, – and that's what we recommend and I recommend in the book is, you know, take your current sales process, your current sales cycle, right, and reverse engineer it a bit. You know, who are the, the players general, generally involved? Generally, on in successful sales cycles, where have you, you know, what was the road that you took people down? What was the road that they followed? What was successful on some versus, you know, ones that weren't successful? And when you start to reverse engineer it a little bit, then you can start to see some trends and things that hopefully you can repeat through that yellow brick road that I mentioned. Can companies do this on their own? Or are they sometimes just oftentimes too close, you know, to see the forest or the trees for the forest? Yeah, it's it's hard for companies. And that's why in the book, I and probably in some cases, I get down to maybe a level of detail that you might even consider extreme. But I've tried <laughs> to make it so that, yeah, somebody who is, you know, in, in deep into this and, as you said, can't see the forest through the trees – kind of give them a, a roadmap or a blueprint that they can work through this objectively. Because the hardest part is doing it objectively and not, you know, having adding too much subjectivity in to the process. So that all said, we know people are still going to need help and assistance with this. And um, we have some other tools and some trainings and some other things that we're looking at releasing. But we really tried to make it as step by step as possible in, in what we've laid out in the book. So who is this for? Is this for the the quota carrying salesperson, for the sales manager, for the CEO? So it's I, I would say our ideal, you know, B2B for the person that, that's the reader of the book would be a marketing leader, number one, because a lot of times marketing is trying to work more with sales and supporting the sales effort. Um, if you have a rev ops or a sales ops person, right, who's very often working with marketing and, you know, working more at the broader team and certainly a sales leader. I had a call on Friday with a, you know, sales leader. He doesn't carry the bag, so to speak, but he's the sales leader of the organization and he's working closely with their marketing teams and, and their uh, rev ops team to, you know, figure out how they can provide a, 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 you know, better, better experience for their prospects and, and certainly get more out of their team. So, no, I don't see this as, you know, somebody that the, the primary reader would not necessarily be the sales rep themselves, although they would certainly, the mindset of this would, would help them. But the details of implementation will generally be driven by, again, depending upon the business marketing, sales ops, rev ops, sales leaders, you know, that, that area. Mm -hmm. um, so we talk a lot about like what has changed, but like what, what has stayed the same? You've been in sales 30 years, right? Uh, but even going back three or four before COVID, like what has stayed consistent? What, what should sales professionals continue doing? Well, there's one thing, and I, and I do bring this up in the book, is, right, you know, the, the, a lot of the same qualification techniques, that you've used in sales. And, and this is, you know, the qualification techniques I've always taught my team and I've used myself is clearly, right, is there a problem? Do we have a solution for that problem? Is the prospect willing to do business with us? Do they have budget? And most importantly, is there an impending event? Is there something that is going to cause them to make a decision and actually move forward? Those things have not changed, right? So, you still have to have a, a, a prospect with a problem. You have to have a solution for their problem. They have to have money. They have to be willing to do business with you. And there needs to be a, generally an impending event for them to make a decision and actually move forward. So that, those fundamentals have not changed. The process is, is how, again, how do you get a prospect through that and have visibility as they move through these and get that data in a more digital world in a potentially a more automated way than the way I was doing it before. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know this book doesn't get into the prospecting side, um, 
but if like how often do prospects really know the issue at hand and the ramifications you know because i've always said if if somebody truly knew the issue they would have already addressed it um Uh, they very rarely do yeah and and again we don't cover this a lot in the book but i I was on another interview uh last week and this came up about prospecting and you know one of the questions was hey we have an sdr team or a or a you know outbound team you know how could they potentially apply this and exactly what you just said is if if i am prospecting knowing that my prospect is probably not really aware of these things and don't understand all the nuances or even any of the things there, how can I help them actually, you know, forget some of that, right? Rather than, hey, can we get on a call? You know, which is what a lot of the calls to action are on a on an outreach. Rather than saying, hey, can we jump on a call or do a discovery meeting or whatever, help them at least get down the right, get down, start going down that yellow brick road, down the right path and provide some clarity and help them make sense or or keep them from falling into the rabbit hole where the confusion is going to occur. So the prospecting effort can take a bit of a different turn when you, you know, take this mindset. Um, I, I just saw an article. They were, this is for employees, right? The boss is saying, Hey, turn your video camera on. Uh, but then I, I've seen, and this was a little while ago, six, eight months ago, um, talking about, hey, you can you can relieve Zoom fatigue by keeping your camera off. Uh, and uh, there's benefits to that, right? Maybe you don't have to get dressed up. Uh, maybe you can take it on your phone, be walking around the house, getting some coffee, you know, walking the dog. Um, have you seen, uh, is there a benefit to one or the other, you know, Obviously, if if their video's off, they can be more relaxed, but maybe they're not paying as, paying as close attention. Uh, you can read the body language and whatnot if you can see everybody. So do you have a recommendation on that? I think it depends. I know that, um, you know, I know for my own company, right, Lead Smart, our, our CRM company, if we're doing a virtual demo or a virtual, you know, walkthrough, having people on camera is actually quite useful. Because you can see, you know, they're sometimes nodding their head or, you know, you can you can see their reaction on or or the other, you know, you can tell that they're tuning out. Right. So I think that's, you know, there are times when having being on camera is really valuable and, be, and really important. There are other times when it's less important in the process. But um, again, I think it, it varies on, you know, the step by step and and what's occurring and and when would, you know. When, when is it most valuable and most useful to be able to, and again, not just to, you know, going back to my demo um, example there, it's, I, I want people to make sure that they're getting it, right? Because you're usually covering a lot of ground in a short period of time. And if you can start seeing people tune out, you can, you know, pull back the reins a little bit and, and make sure that you don't zip past something that nobody really understood. Mm-hmm. Um, although man, it could be hard, right? If there's a lot of people on, yeah. hard to pay attention to all of yeah. them, especially if you got them kind of minimized and, and yeah. you're doing a, a screen share, but. But you can tell, you can see if, you know, when people are engaged and when they're not and, and, you know, especially even just the nodding of the heads or note taking or, you know, there's just things, there's clues that you can see. Yeah. Cool. So uh, your book is coming out right now. Huh? Yes. Um, and where can people get it? Where, where are we sending them? Uh, it'll be on Amazon, of course. Okay. Um, the website for the book is therevenuezone.com. Um, so you can go there. A big part of the book, too, we have, we've we built out quite a bit of a large resource center. So as you go through the book, there's, in fact, there's tools for, for building out this yellow brick road that I talked about. There's quite a few resources that are linked right within the book um, that are going to be continuing to grow. So... Um, as you, you know, as you get into the book, you'll see that, but the revenuezone.com is where the home is of all of those things. So you can learn about the book, access, get the book, and then revenuezone.com slash resources is where you would go once you have the book to get all the resources you need to guide you along the way. Cool. Um, is, um, 
is the trade show circuit firing back up? Would you, are you recommending people get back out and shake some hands or people still afraid? No, I I would definitely, um, it's definitely picking up. There's no doubt about that. And people are excited to get back and doing some in-person stuff. Um, so far it doesn't, it's certainly not as common and as, you know, as frequent and maybe even as well as attended as it was before, but it's definitely, definitely starting to pick up. Yeah. Good. And, um, have you found, um, cause you've written other books, right? No, this is my first book. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, and are, is podcasting like the, the main thing that's been recommended for promotion, like for others that may be considering a book is, um, what else are you seeing that's helping to get the word out? Yeah. So, um, podcasting, you know, working with others like yourself and other people that are in the sales industry, the marketing industry, um, that kind of thing. You know, I've, I guess this is the advantage of my 30 years is, um, you know, I have quite a network, know quite a few few people work with a lot of different people in different companies. So, you know, that's helpful as well, but really, you know, it, it, and you, and you probably have heard this, um, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of conversation now even about low touch sales, you know, how do you have low touch sales and, and more efficient sales. And so there's a lot of conversation going on around the subject that I write about in the revenue zone book, whether it's through the analysts or through other things. So I'm just, you know, my goal is to get the, the word out and get feedback, you know, cause we're going to learn a lot as more and more people work through this process. And that's why we, we invested in building this resource center is there's still a lot of testing to do. Um, and, you know, I'm a software engineer, computer science degree by training. So I'm an engineer and I like to look at data and, and optimize. So we're just in the early stages of this. And, um, you know, there's a lot for all of us to learn and, and for both sides, for the prospect and for the, for the sales side. Um, have you enjoyed the process? Would, would you recommend it to others? <laughs> Writing the book? Yeah. I mean, uh, some so people far, hate it. Some people, yeah. you know, say they love it. It was definitely, um, it was definitely much harder than I thought and much more complicated than I thought. Um, so, you know, it's like anything, right? You expect it to be a certain level of effort and then it turns out to be a little bit more than what you expected. But I've, what I've really enjoyed the most about it is taking the time to, you know, put down on paper what I learned and organizing it in a way that, you know, others can read it and others can use it. And that's, I, I enjoy that part of things. So I've enjoyed that part of the process, some of the logistics of it, you know, some days have been better than others. <laughs> well, you understand. probably know yourself, right? You probably know, know what I'm talking about. I understand. Well, at least you're in a nice place, right? Uh, did, did you grab your laptop and just go to the beach in Santa Barbara and, and get inspiration? Or are you one of those guys that's got to hold yourself up and block everything and just pound it out? Uh, when I write, I need to be just pretty focused. I'm not a good writer when I'm seen on the beach or, or doing something like that, but definitely took some breaks and uh, some walks on the beach to, you know, between chapters. So that's for sure. Yeah. Very cool. All right. So um, the revenue, let me pull up, I got your site right here. It's the revenue zone.com, right? That's it. That's it. All right. Y'all go get the book from Mr. Tom Burton. And then uh, I'll link to your website as well. They need some software. They should probably check you out to streamline their, uh, their yeah, marketing automation, if, huh? Yeah. If you're looking for uh, CRM marketing automation, the company is lead smart technologies and that's leadsmarttech.com And, um, Love to talk to you and help you and see what we can do. Yeah, sounds good. All right, Tom Burton, thanks for coming on the show, man. It's been great. Thanks, Wes. Appreciate it. All right, have a good day. So I am releasing this episode on Cinco de Mayo, uh, and Tom's book is coming out this week uh, on the 8th. Uh, But you can pre-order it if you're listening to this right away. Uh, If you're listening to this after that date, then it's available. Um, So check it out. You know, smart guy. Um, I love these stories, you know, people that they build the tools they wish they had. Um, you know, if the tool doesn't exist, you need to do the same thing. 
Okay, you're not crazy by looking for something. Of course, you can validate it. You ask around, see a few other people have the same problems. Then, then you know you're not alone. They say in politics that for every like one phone call, one fax, one letter, you know, from their constituents, they say that represents ten or even a hundred uh, others. So it's it's how statistics work, right? It's how sampling works. That's how insurance companies make their actuarial tables. So, you know, ask around. If somebody's got a few others have the same same need, go build that thing. Okay? That's how great stories, great businesses are built. So get out there and make it happen. All right? So like I said, be on the lookout. Predictably Profitable Pipeline, a new program I am creating as we speak. Uh, probably going to be emailing it and promoting it this afternoon. Uh, May I'm recording this May 4th, releasing this May 5th. Um, the plan is to start this uh, in May, help you finish Q2 strong, uh, and then support you through the rest of the year um, and create foundational principles that will serve you forever. Okay, The way that I engage with prospects, uh, secure meetings, get to the truth. Uh, the way I do proposals, uh, I've done for well over a decade. You know, I've had the sales whisper now since 2006. Uh, I've put food on the table for a family of nine. I've got three college graduates. My wife has stayed home now for 27 years. So the things that I'm helping you do are proven. They work. They work currently. You know, people ask me, well, you know, back when you were in sales, like, what are you talking about? I sell every single day. <laughs> I still have an eight-year-old. So <laughs> I got to get after this for a long time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but, you know, I have fun. It's not stressful. It's not hard. You know, I always say there's two types of sales, the easy ones and those you don't get. So professional salespeople uh, have fun. They make great money. They help a lot of people. It's why they make a lot of money. So it doesn't have to be a grind. You don't need to know NLP or hypnosis or, or use cheesy tactics or gambits or be unscrupulous. You know, we just had uh, Layla Gray on uh, talking about propaganda fluent. Uh, you don't have to use propaganda, manipulative tactics. Ugh, it's all icky. It was always bad. Now with social media, you're going to get blown up in a bad way if you're cheesy and pushy and manipulative. So that ain't how we roll. Okay, so if you're interested, you want to know about the program, hit me up online. Hit me up at the saleswhisper.com. You can do the contact us. You can find me on the Facebook here. Find me on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. I've been on LinkedIn since, golly, 2004. Been on Twitter, I don't know, 2008 or so. I forget. You can look it up. There's the thing on there. I always forget where to look. But, uh, hey, cool. you know, Twitter's a lot more fun now, just with Elon even hinting at buying it, right? He could still back out. I've told people, just doing the due diligence, being able to look under the hood and under the bed and in the closets, <laughs> that'd be worth the price of admission in and of itself. But I digress. Hit me up. Let me help you sell Mo better. All right? Thanks for listening. I'll go sell something. <laughs>